Good morning, ladies. So we are in week three of making peace with your past. Today we're gonna to be talking about our homework that we did last week. Hopefully you ladies did uh, compulsive behavior, the, the unit, I think unit two or three. We're gonna be going over that in a little bit, but before we do that, I wanna be able to give you some foundation of what we will be building upon going forward. So this was actually not covered. The first two or three slides were not covered in the homework assignment. You'll get a chance to, to learn about what cognitive behavioral therapy is as it is in relation to compulsive behaviors. And don't worry, you're not getting graded if you didn't do your homework. So <laughs> you'll get an opportunity to catch up with everybody else. All right, so cognitive behavioral therapy. This therapy was created in the 1960s by Aaron Beck. And what he suggests is the CBT triangle, according to his therapy. It's the therapy that most counselors use in their sessions. It's the one that we primarily use as well in our counseling sessions. And this is the whole premise of it. Thoughts affect our emotions and our emotions affect our behaviors. Thoughts affect how we feel and how we feel affects what we do. And so a lot of theories suggest that we have 30,000 thoughts a day. Talk about thinking constantly. We are constantly thinking 30,000 thoughts a day. And you might think, no, that's not me. I'm not thinking, but the reality is you are, but maybe your thoughts are more automatic and in the subconscious mind that you just may not be aware of your thinking. And so one of the things that we do in our counseling sessions, when you come in and maybe you're talking about what's happened in the past or what's going on um, in your life, we'll ask these questions that may sound very bland or redundant. Well, tell me what you were thinking in that moment. <laughs> if you've been in counseling, you know that's what we like to ask. Tell me how you were feeling in that moment. And if you're not familiar with this therapy, you may not know, and you might think, why is my counselor asking me these questions? We are trying to peel back the onion, the layers of the onion. We're trying to identify what is driving you to be able to do the behaviors that you are engaging in, okay? According to this theory, thoughts don't just come out of nowhere, right? Thoughts don't just come out of nowhere. Thoughts actually all come from the beliefs and values that we hold in our subconscious mind. All right. So as a refresher course, thoughts affect what? And emotions affect? Wow, you guys are paying attention. Good. And our thoughts come from our beliefs and values. This is called the CBT iceberg model. This is what is very helpful to, to help us see this a little bit more clearly. So everyone's familiar with probably the Titanic and the iceberg that the Titanic hit. And we all know that what is above the water, the observable, is very small in comparison to what's beneath the surface, right? So the observable, the scene, the behaviors is at the tip of the iceberg, but beneath that, as we know, as we've already learned, is the emotions. Beneath the emotions is the thought processes, the self-talk that you have. Remember, we have 30,000 thoughts a day. Beneath the thoughts, at the very bottom of the ocean, is the values and the beliefs that give birth to our thoughts. <clears throat> so... Beliefs are so important because we all have them, whether we are aware of them or not. We have beliefs about ourselves, about other people, about the world. And you may have a belief because of maybe the, the dysfunction of your household growing up. You might believe no one will ever be there for me. You may believe that people are untrustworthy. You may believe I am unworthy. Very, very common beliefs that I too often see in my counseling sessions. And these beliefs give birth to thought processes of, I can't trust anyone, which maybe gives birth to emotions of anxiety and fear, which maybe this, 
a huge reason as to why you may avoid social situations or avoid going to women's conferences, et cetera, et cetera. So it's so important that we, um, we question the behaviors, right? It's so easy to see the behaviors, but a lot of us, we don't do the work to be able to reflect what is driving those behaviors. And this CBT iceberg model in relation to compulsive uh, behaviors, compulsive behavior is the tip of the iceberg and will remain compulsive if one does not examine their feelings, thoughts, values, and beliefs. And so the first thing that I want you to do when you are examining your compulsive behavior, and compulsive behavior looks different for everyone, is examine, why am I doing this? Become your own therapist. Begin to ask yourself the questions that are so necessary, right? The Bible says, examine my heart, oh God. It can be quite scary sometimes asking the questions, asking the difficult questions, but it's so necessary and God does not have us do this by ourselves. He is with us along the way. Examine my heart, oh God. So. For example, if you have a shopping addiction compulsion, you may not know that maybe you are engaging in, in compulsive behaviors. And so the tip of the iceberg, those are the things that you see. Your husband brings it up to you. Hey, honey, you can't go over the budget again, but you continue to do it. So it's so important to examine what's beneath the surface, what's driving uh, that compulsive behavior. That's step one, examine. Step two is to challenge that thought process, that belief. Well, how is this serving me? How is this thought, how is this belief serving me? If you believed that you were unworthy of love, of aff affection, unless you had something, maybe as a child, you um, only got your parents' attention if you came home with an A plus or uh, maybe a homemade Mother's Day card and that was the only time your mom ever gave you some type of attention, Maybe you believe that somehow your worth was tied to what you can give or what you can present. And as you grow up, the compulsive behavior could be, I have to have the newest and greatest gadgets or the newest clothes or the newest shoes or whatever the case may be. And so that's why maybe the compulsive behavior of shopping addiction takes place. So it's challenging that once you identify, well, how is this behavior serving me? How is this feeling of inadequacy, the reason why I'm shopping so much is because I feel inadequate, how is this actually helping me? You're digging the layers of the onion. You are ensuring that your internal world, right, the thoughts, the emotions, the beliefs are congruent with the external world, right? How is this thinking helping me? How is this belief helping me? So step one, examining. Step two, challenging. And then step three would be to replace or add a new belief. <clears throat> replace or add a new belief. And so if you believed you were, I am unworthy, is the belief that you carry that drives the compulsive behavior of maybe overeating. You can question it. How is this belief serving me? It's probably not. If you aren't able to replace it, for whatever reason, uh, you can add another belief, another polar opposite belief, which would look like I am worthy because of what Christ has already done for me. I think I told you ladies a couple weeks ago that we are allowed to have conflicting emotions for one situation. And I use the example of, I have a lot of love for my husband, but sometimes I can be angry. I'm sure everyone here can agree with that. You are allowed to have multiple beliefs. So if you have a belief that says I am unworthy or I am inadequate, well, challenging it and adding the belief of what scripture tells you that you already are. And then becoming aware and mindful of when you are operating in negative beliefs that do not serve you. So that you can flip the script, get into a positive belief that will serve you. So in relation to knowing the CBT model, knowing the importance of how our beliefs impact, our thoughts impact, our feelings impact, our behaviors, I'm pretty sure you had some revelations this past week with the compulsive behavior. And if you're following along, it's on page 31 in your book. We're just gonna go over 
recognizing compulsive behavior, for those of uh, us that maybe didn't get a chance to do it, because I get it, life gets busy. I just don't want to sound redundant and repetitive. So we're going to go ahead and do this very briefly. So how do I know if I'm engaging in, in compulsive behavior? That's a very good question. We're going to go over it. Number one, it is repetitive and ritualistic. Repetitive and ritualistic. Let's say, I'll give you an example, kind of going back to the CBT model. Let's say that I have a difficult time, I don't know, getting up in the morning. My alarm clock goes off at 6 a.m. in the morning. Is, is anyone else a morning person? <laughs> Okay, we got one person who's a morning person. Who's not a morning person? Show of hands. All right. Y'all the real ones. Thank you. All right. Let's say that every morning at 6 o'clock, the alarm clock goes off. And the first thought that you have is, oh, man, it's time to wake up. That's the first thought. That thought will give birth to emotions of anxiety, maybe sadness, maybe boredom. We learned, I think, uh, last session that boredom is actually an emotion which is something that I learned as well. So that emotion of boredom is probably going to make me hit the snooze button and then therefore I'm late to whatever I gotta do in the morning. So that's just an example of how we use the CBT model in our everyday life. Now compulsive behavior, it's repetitive and ritualistic. If I'm hitting the snooze button every single morning, like five, six times, number one, I'm probably gonna drive my husband crazy. And number two, I would probably be engaging in compulsive behavior, okay? Another sign of compulsive behavior is that it has hidden cause causes. So let's say that your compulsive behavior is that you're constantly cleaning the house. Again, cleaning the house is a very good thing. I would hope that you would want a clean house. I'm sure that we all do, right? But the hidden cause is exactly what it is. It's unknown. You don't really know why you're doing what you're doing. One of the examples that the book actually provides, I'm not sure what page it's on, but it says that a compulsive woman that engages in, in a lot of cleanliness, she may wake up every single morning and start vacuuming at 9 a.m. And then two hours go by and she starts vacuuming the same room again at 11 o'clock. And if you ask her, why are you doing that? She won't be able to provide an answer, right? So it has hidden causes. And so a lot of that could be from a developed belief that you developed in early childhood. I am not good enough, or I am only good enough when my house is perfect. Maybe there was a standard of perfection in your household as a child that everything had to be dress dressed and perfect. And so you internalize that belief, you made that become something that belongs to you. And so now as an adult, you engage in compulsive cleaning. That belief, of I will not be good enough until my house is perfect will give birth to thinking that looks like this. I need to clean the bathroom right now while you are in the middle of a conversation with your husband. So he doesn't even have your full attention because you are thinking about cleaning the bathroom. Another sign of compulsive behavior could be it's, it has a controlling force behind it. Even when your husband says, hey dear, that's good enough, you just cleaned the bathrooms actually last night, it's still not good enough for you, right? You have this controlling force behind that compulsion that you just have to get it done. Another sign is that it drains large amounts of energy. This is pretty self-explanatory. Compulsive people work hard at their compulsions. A next sign is that it's a way to avoid feelings. It's a way to avoid feelings. And so a compulsive behavior of gluttony, of overeating. Maybe if you grew up in, in a household of dysfunction, you learn that there's constant chaos. You have no control over what anything is, wh who, what anyone does or what's going on in the household. And so what happens is it's almost, I do have control over what I put in my body, over what I eat. So maybe you engage in overeating as a way to avoid the feelings, that inner pain that you felt as a child. Compulsive behavior both feels both good and bad. It feels good to eat, but when you're full, it feels really sucky. Every Thanksgiving, I regret my three plates of turkey. It also, when it comes to overcleaning, it feels good to be productive. Yes, my house is clean. 
but then you're exhausted and you don't even have the time or the energy to want to spend time with your kids. And another sign of compulsive behavior, the last one, which I believe is probably one of the most important ones, is that it's reproductive. So the example in the book talks about how maybe you grew up with an alcoholic father, an alcoholic mother, and as a child, you saw how terrible that was because of all the chaos that it created. So you vowed to never drink. I'm never going to drink. I'm going to grow up and do what I need to do. But you grow up and you become overproductive by a fault to the point where maybe you become a CEO of a company, you're working 16 hours, you're working on the weekends, and your children don't spend time with their mom. So it's reproductive as in it's generational. It can change, it can shape shift to be another compulsive behavior. So it's so important that we do the work within ourselves and ask ourselves, what compulsive behavior do I engage in because of the dysfunction in my own household as a child. So the book gives these examples that I believe you may or may not relate to. So we're just gonna go over them really quickly. Addiction to alcohol, tobacco products and other drugs, eating disorders, work addiction, sex addiction, gambling addiction, believe it or not, exercise addiction, and shopping addiction. Does anybody maybe want to add something to this list? I actually had a couple more. Hoarding. Would that Hoarding, be yes. Yeah. Hoarding is another one. And like keeping a schedule where you have a schedule and you don't want to deviate no matter what. Yes. You want to try to stay on that schedule. And TV. Hmm. And um, another screen time perfectionism. Yes. Yes. Wow. If we could grade here, you would get an A plus. <laughs> yeah. Cause that's actually in our upcoming notes. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for that. So yes, absolutely. You may or may not relate to some of these. And so I wanted to ensure that this session was going to be something that was relatable. So the next slide goes over other physical compulsions that you may or may not relate to. I'll be going over physical compulsions and then Giselle will take it over with mental compulsions. So physical or external rituals include collecting or hoarding items, which my friend over here mentioned, yes. I actually knew a person who every time I went to their house, there was nowhere to sit down and nowhere to like put your body. Like you just felt very uncomfortable everywhere that you went. And I remember just not really understanding that, why this person just continued to collect and collect and hoard and hoard and acquire and acquire up until I started learning about and how our beliefs drive everything that we do. The more that I listened to this person's story, this person grew up in a third world country and didn't have anything, very little to nothing, didn't have toys, didn't have the luxuries that we have here. And so it only makes sense that a possible belief that this person internalized was, it is up to me to get the things that I want. So when you're operating from that belief, it's only obvious that you will grow up and continue to acquire and hoard and do all the things. And again, it doesn't always manifest as hoarding. If you hold on to that belief, it can manifest in different ways. Another one would be excessively Googling you or your loved one's physical symptoms. I'm pretty sure we all did that back in March of 2020. I know I did. I would cough and Google how long until I die. We didn't know much back then. So Excessively Googling you or your loved one's physical symptoms, if you're constantly doing it over and over and you are not in tune with your internal world, again, it has to have those two things. You're excessively doing it and you're not in tune as to why you're doing it. You're just doing it. That could be a compulsive behavior. Number three, cleaning your house, work environment, or other areas repeatedly or a specific number of times. We talked about that already. This one right here is huge. The next one, seeking reassurance from friends, family members, or religious figures. Don't get me wrong. Seeking reassurance sometimes can be a good, but again, if we are doing it excessively and we're not in tune 
with what's going on beneath the surface. Why do I constantly go to this person for reassurance? What's driving that behavior? Asking yourself the, the big questions is so important. Feeling driven to confess certain actions over and over. I actually knew another person who was a recovering alcoholic. And anytime this person would get around someone new, this person felt like they had to confess all of their sins to this new individual that they're just meeting. It was a compulsive behavior. They just had to confess. I have a theory that maybe they developed a belief as a child that says, I am a terrible person. And so that belief was possibly driving that compulsive behavior of, I have to let everyone know that I'm a terrible person. And the last one is avoiding triggers or any situation likely to lead to a compulsion. Now, if you are a recovering alcoholic, you may avoid situations, you may avoid going to social gatherings if you know that they're going to be providing cocktails. That would be an example of that. Or you may avoid going to your family's Thanksgiving dinner or Christmas dinner because you know that they might provide wine. Again, it's, if it's done in excess, you're excessively doing it to the point where you're just shutting yourself out from the whole world and you're not in tune with what's going on in the internal world of you, that could be compulsive behavior. And so now I'll turn it over to Giselle and she'll let us know what mental compulsions look like. So mental compulsions can be thoughts that come to your mind and one negative thought can lead to another negative thought. And they can happen in a big scale that, like Tatiana was talking about, where it is compulsive, but they can also happen on a lesser scale where you're having negative thoughts and they're negatively affecting you. And the Bible we know says, guard your thoughts. And so sometimes when we are spiraling, we're thinking one negative thought that leads into another negative thought. And this can happen to anyone during times of like one time at a job interview, I got one of the questions wrong and my mind went to, you're not going to get this job. And then, so I'm pausing and I'm like, uh, that one is not fresh in my mind. And so I stopped my thought because I was in the middle of an interview and then I completed the interview. And I left feeling, oh, this, that was terrible. I'm so embarrassed. And it was a rainy day and I forgot my umbrella. And I said, there's no way I'm going back and showing my face because I got that question totally wrong. And then it turns out I actually got the job. <laughs> so I think it's pretty normal that spiraling can happen to all of us, but hopefully we can catch it on time. And it doesn't have to negatively affect us. Making, I think someone mentioned this in the audience, making a list and doing things like a to-do list and getting it done. And a lot of times that can be very useful to all of us where we tend to be very busy, especially in this area. When it becomes a problem is when we're feeling that our worth comes from what we're able to accomplish. And then another one is going over a conversation that happened. She said this, and then I said this, and then she said this, and I can't believe, and what does she mean? And things like that. So when it becomes a, a compulsion is when there's not a stop to it. When we keep it going for a long time, way more than it should go, and we don't say, okay, this happened, what am I going to do about it? And then you know, this is, we mentioned before where journaling can be useful in not continuing that negative thought pattern all day, but like giving yourself a set amount of time to talk about what's bothering you. If you don't talk about it, to write it in your journal and then maybe come up with what you're going to do about it and leave it there. And mentally undoing or canceling out a negative emotion or image with a positive one. That can be problematic because we don't want to be, okay, no, I'm not going to be sad. I'm not going to be sad. I'm not going to cry. And then we get stuck with our emotions and our joys and our happiness and our sadness and our anger doesn't flow. We get stuck in like 
a certain set of emotions that we allow ourselves to have because we feel those are the acceptable emotions that I'm gonna have. Freedom over compulsiveness. Re-examine your heartfelt view of God and your relationship to him. He is the creator of the universe and you are his precious child. After he created everything on the earth, he gave you dominion over it and he made you in his image. What can we do that could make us be more than who he created us to be? Is there anything else we need to do? Make a conscious decision to let go and give God control. The Bible says, in all things, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your request be known unto the Lord. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts in Christ Jesus always. So when we're having that negative thought that leads to compulsion and that leads to bad emotion, we can pick it up maybe during meditation and journaling and drop it off at the cross and it can stay there. It doesn't have to follow us all day. All right, thank you, Giselle. Yes, those are some good, good tools here, freedom over compulsiveness, because my guess is that maybe some of you do engage in compulsive behavior, whether it's mental or physical. And so in just a little bit, we will turn it over to your tables to have small group conversations, and we'll be discussing all things compulsive behavior. All right, so these are some of the questions here, small group discussions. Number one, are you engaging in compulsive behavior in what way? Can you recognize your compulsive behavior keeps you from feeling certain emotions? If so, describe. Did your family of origin feel out of control when you were a child? Do you, need, do you have a need to be in control? If so, what do you try to control? Do you have compulsive or addictive behavior in your life that hurts your relationships with God or other people? And lastly, do you have compulsive behavior in your life that makes you feel tired? Well, this was a good um, session on compulsive behavior and hopefully, and whether you did the homework or not, I hope you ladies learned something today. Your homework will be unit three, release from shame. Page 45 to... 63, 20 pages of homework and you have two weeks to do it. Thank you for listening to myself and Giselle. It's been an honor and privilege. Father, thank you so much for this time to be together. God, we just thank you that you have given us your word and your instruction to guide us. And Lord, I pray that as these women go out these next two weeks, Lord, that you would just bring to mind your beautiful truths that you would just help them combat every lie with your word, Lord. And that as they do, Father, that you would just strengthen the relationship with you. Thank you so much that we can come to you, Lord, and that you give us life. We praise you and give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. My father's heart, there's a place for me. I'm a child.